So we've reached a point in our conversation about prayer, meditation and prayer, that we can do what we've been doing for past sections, where it's uh, let's look at what other people have to say, different, different points of view, which we might not agree with. And quite befitting that this is Reformation Day, so now we're going to look at a, a Catholic position. And this will be intercession of the saints, prayers to the saints, and why we might not agree with this. But uh, to explain a little bit further, this is not just a Roman Catholic practice. You can also find this in Eastern Orthodoxy. Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism don't say the same things about this necessarily, but they both have it. Um, I'd also say uh, the Coptic Church also, also includes it, but they're pretty much Eastern Orthodox themselves. But uh, they're, one of the, we're, they're one of those groups that split off early, so they're kind of isolated, so, but, so they're different enough that in terms of a political statement that they're politically different from the Eastern Orthodox, they have a different um, organization but theologically they're very similar to Eastern Orthodox. So much so that right now in the past, I think decade, they've gone into talks with the patriarch in Constantinople to try and see if they can integrate back into Eastern Orthodoxy as a whole. So, uh, Persa Saints, not just Catholics, but we're gonna be focusing on Catholicism because I have resources for Catholicism. I don't have as many resources for Eastern Orthodoxy on these types of practice. But this will show kind of the extreme uh, that, that these practices are adopted. So um, I have here canons, or rather the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. So the Council of Trent is basically the Roman Catholic response to the Reformation. So when the Reformation began, they, the Roman Catholic Church pretty much cut off a whole bunch of stuff in the north. Oh, oh. oh. oh I haven't seen it. So, um, yeah, during the Reformation, Northern Europe was more or less where the Reformation was taking place. You had the stuff in Germany going on, that was the Lutheran. Uh, Northern Germany, which was Anabaptist, and then they kind of spread a little bit here and there. Um, uh, the Swiss Reformation, where you get the Zwinglian Church, later adopting Calvin, and then just becoming the Reformed Church in general. Then you also have the reform in England, and then you have eventually the Anglican Church. So you can also say that it's multiple reformations going on at the same time. And because all this was going on in the north, the Roman Catholics in the south were basically trying to consolidate their power there uh, with those who were friendly to them, and then that's where you get the Council of Trent. So the Council of Trent was trying to maintain a lot of the doctrines that were called into question, as well as chop off the ones that were obviously bad, because the Roman Catholic Church um, that, that wasn't part of the Reformation movement, they still recognized that there, there were bad things going on in the church, and then there needed to be a reform. This was obvious for over a century, uh, but it just didn't get off the ground until you have a whole bunch of people in the north making multiple reformations to try and correct all this stuff. So part of that, part of the stuff that uh, the Roman Catholic Church tried to maintain would be invocation, veneration, and relics of saints and, and sacred images. Uh, this is the 25th from the 25th session of the Council of Trent, because the Council of Trent was over multiple years. So they had, they had uh, a number of different sessions. So this is from 1563. Um, yeah, the Holy Council commands all bishops and others who hold the office of teaching and have charge of the Cura and Amarum 
That in concordance with the usage of Catholic and Apostolic Church received from the primitive times of the Christian religion and with the unanimous teaching of the Holy Fathers and the decrees of sacred councils, they above all instruct the faithful diligently in matters related to intercession and invocation of the saints, the veneration of relics, and the legitimate use of images, teaching them that the saints who reign together with Christ offer up their prayers to God for men, and that it is good and beneficial suppliantly to invoke them and to have recourse to their prayers, assistance and support in order to obtain favors from God through Jesus, through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who alone is our redeemer and savior. And that they think impiously who deny that the saints who enjoy eternal happiness in heaven are to be invoked or who assert that they do not pray for men or that our invocation of them to pray for each of us individually is idolatry or that it is opposed to the word of God and consistent with the honor of the one mediator of God and men, Jesus Christ, or that it is foolish to pray vocally or mentally to those who reign in heaven. Man, that's a long sentence. <clears throat> oh, so there's one sentence in here. <laughs> uh, so bottom line, they're saying the historic Christian church has always unanimously, unanimously said that you can pray to saints in heaven, even though recognizing Jesus Christ is one true mediator uh, between God and man, you can still use other mediators to get to Jesus Christ and obtain favors from God. The saints, you can, you can pray to them to get various favors from, from the one mediator, Jesus Christ, and then also from God, uh, the Father. So, <laughs> thoughts or comments about that? <laughs> We were brought up with like, well, No. <laughs> it's like a lot of people often, you know, have, you know a, a long, long paragraph to say something that normal person would say in one sentence. <laughs> well, that was one sentence. They just didn't put, they just didn't put a period anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> At least not in the English version, I think. So what is the difference between us asking each other to pray to God? The one mm -hmm. I, I guess it's because of their day. The Pretty day. much. That's the only reason. Well, that would be I the mean, primary I, mode of communication. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I understand we, we can talk directly to God, so we don't need to talk to anybody else. Mm -hmm. But we often will ask one uh, us to pray for other people, mm -hmm. and we're interceding. Like, why do we do that? And then instead of just saying, "Go ahead, pray on your own," I, I, is the collective going to be more powerful than an individual prayer? No. Not necessarily, no. No. So, why do we do it? <laughs> I don't know why other people would like to okay. so support people. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it would just the one is like the body, but um, it's just like me asking you to, to say grace when we, when we have a, a lunch meeting because you seem to find better words sometimes. <laughs> well, so I think it's even though God knows what's in our heart, even though God knows what we want to say, some isn't, people have better words. Isn't there a Bible verse in regards to uh, uh, two or one or two? Two or more among you are in agreement. You should pray over this particular um, uh, request. And I can't remember where exactly that Bible verse is. But you must see the people that they know. Yeah, they've not been tender a lot. <laughs> Okay, I don't have you on. <laughs> so, no, the main issue is the mode of communication if we're asking somebody to intercess for us. So, if you're here on earth, you can ask person A, can ask person B, please pray for me. And person B can actually hear person A. Uh, you could also ask, <clears throat> say, a deaf person. Let's let, let let's say person B is deaf. You're trying to communicate with them. Please pray for me, but they don't pray for you. 
Now what do you do? <laughs> well, you have to use other modes of communication. You have to use sign language or, or written form of something. Um, you also use Braille. <laughs> There's very various ways that you can actually talk to somebody and then you know that they're praying for you. Um, part of intercession might actually be somebody praying on your behalf, but then not even telling you. And at that point, you didn't ask them to do anything, but they're still praying on your behalf. Now, the issue is when you're trying to go to a vertical direction. Because here we can say, yes, you can hear me because there is vibrating, it's bearing the sound of my voice and you are understanding the words. But if we're going that direction, going up, we're gonna need a very different mode to communicate. And we'd actually need that person, if they're going to intercess for us, to understand what we're saying. So if somebody in heaven is listening, or <laughs> that's a bad way to, well, I'll try to describe it a different way. Um, if somebody in heaven is around the throne of God and praying to our, to our Father in heaven, how can we actually communicate with them? Well, the default form as is presented by the Roman Catholic Church, even Orthodox, uh, would be to pray. And pray in such a manner that they would be able to hear you in heaven. But who do you normally pray to? Jesus. God. God. So you're performing an action that normally you would do to God, but now associated with not God. So if, if we're spanning heaven and earth and we have no idea if the saint can actually hear us, we would want to have some sort of confirmation from God to say that this is even possible in the first place. And we would also have to assume a number of, a number of things. We actually have to assume the person in heaven has a certain level of omniscience, like God. Because if I'm down here on earth and they need to hear my prayer, they would have to be able to span heaven and earth to hear this prayer. They would also have to be able to, as many arguments have been presented by various objectors to this, they would also have to be able to hear not just person A, but also person A1, A2, A3, going to A10,000 or so, almost all at the same time. Especially if we're talking, say, with the Roman Catholic Church, and even the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, Mary, Mother Mary, because usually she's the one a lot of people pray for. Uh, the Hail Mary is prayed all the time. So Mary would have to hear millions upon millions of prayers simultaneously. And to be quite frank, that's beyond the human level to do. Yeah. Yeah, so having not lived in heaven, how do you know she can't hear them? We have absolutely no evidence no, that she can. Or any other angel or anybody else in heaven can hear or, or not hear or pray. All we know is what scripture tells us that God hears. Yeah. 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 So the other extrapolation is by Basically, as the Roman Catholic yeah. Church usually frames it, or at least the one, the people that I've heard talk about it, um, is that since they are no longer fettered by their mortal. mortal shell and they are pure spirit, the spirits are now capable of so much more than your mortal body. But again, we have absolutely no word from God that this is actually the case. Uh, in fact, I would actually argue there would still be a whole bunch of limitations on the human soul. And I would, I would also assume that those church, like East, uh, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic would say the same, that they're not an infinite soul, therefore they're not capable of the same things of God. Uh, saying otherwise would actually be blasphemy. 
So, so you would actually still have limits to the human soul, and we don't know what those limits are. You would actually need the word of God to establish it. Is, is there anywhere in the Bible that says to pick sin? We're going to get into that, but no, there isn't. Because <laughs> okay. I mean, it says to, to pray to God or Father. I say, here's your prayers. I mean, yeah, clearly, yeah. we know that it's black and white, right? Yeah. I, yeah, so there's many, many passages. Pray to God the Father. There's many passages pray to Jesus Christ. Not as many as to God the Father, because usually he's the one identified as the one in heaven. Jesus is usually around us at, at, um, whenever he's featured in scripture. But, but we do so refer pray. to um, a prayer that Jesus intercedes for us to the Father. Yeah. But it's the Father. Yeah. Like I, I'll, I'm always confused by that. Yeah. yeah. Um, How does he intercede if he's the same person? Right. Why would well, he write that word? You have to be careful. He's the same God, sharing the same substance, but he's not the same person of the Trinity. Yeah. Um, but we actually do have biblical evidence for that, because the book of Hebrews goes into great detail. Uh, Jesus as the great high priest, the one who is the mediator between us and God, uh, when he offered up his sacrifice once for all, as high priests usually do, high priests offer up sacrifices, Jesus Christ, who offers his sacrifice, once for all, it is now done. And since he doesn't need to offer up sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, he can be seated at the right hand of God, making constant intercession for us based on that one sacrifice. He doesn't have to make another sacrifice, not the sacrifice, not the sacrifice. He can just say, look back to this one. So the book of Hebrews is talking about how Jesus is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us, always talking to us to the Father on our behalf, so that we may be forgiven by the one sacrifice. I'm trying to remember exactly which chapter. I want to say it's chapter 10. It is chapter 10. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the main issue is this element, like the, the going up into heaven. But if you're using something that is normally normally given to God, but normally devoted to God, that mode or that method, it is unique to God. Um, it's been a great benefit to me to actually do a devotion series going through the book of Exodus. As you can see, a lot of how worship was supposed to be done, not necessarily that it was done because people were worshiping golden calf and all, but how it was supposed to be done. And even something, as you would assume, innocuous as a particular type of oil or a particular type of incense. If you use that same type of oil or incense for something else, you are taking what was supposed to be sacred and set aside only for God, now putting it to some common use. Now you are cut off from God's people, and you could actually be stoned. Again, for making a, a particular type of oil, making a particular type of incense. And that was because these things were supposed to be absolutely sacred to God. So if you're taking what was uh, um, only to God and putting it to some other use, you are now violating the first commandment in addition to the third commandment. But basically, you're going, you're, you're recognizing this thing as worthy of the same type of attention God is. First commandment, you shall have no other gods. So if you take, even though you might not recognize this thing as a god that you're giving incense to or the oil or the anointing oil, you're still giving it what is only proper to God. So that's one of the issues. When when you look into Old Testament worship, it is this is only for God. Um yeah. I'm a little confused. Hmm. I was brought up that you can pray to God hmm. at any time hmm. under any circumstances. Hmm. Nothing about oil and incense and all these yeah. things. So does that conflict with any of the current interpretation? No. Okay. No, it's uh, because this prayer is open 
to you to pray. Like you're you're doing this one thing. Yeah. Um, but if you're taking a prayer, you're treating this as something very sacred, something very good, and now praying to the person down the street. Yeah, okay. That would be very difficult to say. You're like, no, but that, that would not be appropriate. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a different kettle of fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so back to my question hmm. is Holy Mary, Mother God, right? She's deceased, so we shouldn't pray to her. But when we ask Paul to pray for me, if mm -hmm. I do that, mm -hmm. what is the difference? That he can do it he's living. He's here, can you she's there. Okay. So you can actually talk to Paul, he's, he's right there. Um, can you talk to Mary? And you would actually need something beyond your current ability here you would actually have to be dipping into something sacred that is something godly in order to try and communicate to anybody beyond this so without a divine command to actually do so you have no grounds to say that this is true but not what grounds do you have to say it's not true like i'm, okay, I'm not either way right yeah, let, let's go into we it we don't then. live in heaven so we don't know either way We don't know if we get pogo sticks in heaven, but you won't, but you shouldn't make a doctrine. Everybody will get a pogo stick if you don't believe in the pogos. If you'll get a pogo stick in heaven, uh, you're outside of the Catholic Church. That would be a bad thing to do. So if you're treating this something as possible and you're saying now that it's absolutely true, that is a move. That is trying to say God is making a divine decree through me. It is. No, so seriously. Um, because if you're saying this is something I want to think is rational, therefore it is true, you are making an executive decision on how to practice religion outside of God's explicit command and authority. You're making it on your own authority. And when you find people trying to do that in the Bible, well, God condemns them. Specifically, like King Saul. Uh, King Saul, he was actually trying to be extremely pious. Truly, he was. And this was why God was against Saul, because Saul was trying to be a nice guy. So, when God gave him the divine command to kill all these people in this area because they have gone in the way of idolatry, so don't take anything from them, Saul decided, okay, well, I'll kill the standing army, and then I'll just take everything else. I'll take all this spoils war. And God looked at Saul and went, no, you're, you weren't supposed to have mercy on these people. Now you're going to be corrupted by their false religion. The next thing was a certain type of sacrifice had to be made. Samuel was to be, the prophet Samuel, was to be the one who was going to offer up the sacrifice. That was how it was supposed to be. That's how God divided basically the state and, and uh, the, the religion at that time. Saul was, was waiting for Samuel and he thought, well, this is later than what God wanted it to be. So I'm going to sacrifice, offer up the sacrifice in Samuel's place. Saul did this. And then when Samuel came around and saw that the sacrifice had already been done, he, because he was a prophet, by the word of God, condemn Saul, saying, you should not have done this. This was not given to you. This was not your proper practice. Saul was acting in all sorts of piety to try and say, this is what we should do, outside of an express word from God, and therefore was condemned. And now, uh, 1 Samuel, chapter... 28. And unfortunately, this is going to be a very long passage. So I would really like to go through the whole thing. But we don't have enough time. So we'll, we'll skip down to verse 8. 1 Samuel 28, verse 8. 
So Samuel has already died. The prophet Samuel has already died. And Saul is now kind of befuddled. He's in a bad situation. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes. And that night, he and two men went to the woman, that is, the witch of Endor. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I made. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me now? Uh, why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell from full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and night. And we'll stop there. Mm -hmm. So, you might notice something. Mm -hmm. Person A, or Saul, went to the witch of Endor to consult Samuel in heaven. This is one of the few, actually one of the two instances that I know of in scripture where we actually have somebody alive contacting somebody who has died in the faith. We'll get to the other one in a, in a minute. So I have Saul contacting which Ben or so that he can contact Samuel. What's Samuel's response? Why didn't you come earlier? Why <laughs> <laughs> yeah. call me now? I'm not here. I'm not here to. Yeah, I'm. I'm not here anymore. Yeah, yeah there's. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you consulting me? The Lord has already turned away from you. So, um, and, and in that we all you already can see that Saul is actually using Samuel as a last resort. Mm -hmm. Because he said that the prophets aren't talking to me. Yeah, yeah, he's saying that the normal means, the normal way of actually contacting God isn't working. So as a last resort, now he's going to intercession. <laughs> but there's something Samuel points to because he's saying that well now that you can't I can't do anything for you anyways, but he's also pointing to in verse 17 what the Lord has done and what He predicted through me. So Samuel, let's say Samuel heaven, Samuel. What he's actually doing is he's hearing Saul, but he's going. Go to God, specifically his word. What were his commands? Mm -hmm. Go to the go to God's word. Yeah. You should have done this already. So because Samuel, sorry, because Saul has basically done what is wrong. He, he said, again, he was trying to be extremely pious in many respects. 
that he was going against God's command, but was explicitly God's word. And when he go, tries to get around all this, tries to go to a, to a Satan in heaven, the Satan in heaven points him back to God and points him back to the word. This is what you were supposed to do at the beginning. Uh, the saint doesn't communicate this to God. He already, the saint in heaven already knows this is too late. He should have contacted God. Look to his word. But we'll actually see this kind of drawn out um, even further. We'll be going to Luke. And this is the second instance. Uh, rich man and Lazarus. So this is Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. <clears throat> so there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And his gate was at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The answer. Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Again, this is the only other instance in scripture where somebody from who's living or well, somebody who's who's not necessarily living, but somebody who's trying to get an intercession. Uh, so you have rich man, big bucks, and now he's unfortunately. In hell. Uh, the actual term here, I believe, is, is Hades, so it's not quite hell yet. The, the fire and judgment only come about after uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, who changes cosmology. Anyways, um, so the rich man's there. So he's trying to go to Father Abraham. Uh, nice, nice long beard there. Uh, Spirit has wisdom, has wisdom. Um, so Abraham does not go to, does not go to God, nor does he, as the, as the rich man requests, go to poor Lazarus in heaven. Instead, what Abraham does is he points directly to Moses, prophets, and we can even put in brackets here, someone raised from the dead. Now, 
Now, he's saying that this is true for this guy who's already in Hades, already in hell. But he's also saying that you would look here for anybody who's still alive, rather than them trying to listen to the same heaven, somebody who's still alive in Christ. You're supposed to look to these things. Moses, Abraham means by Moses the first five books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. By prophets, he means the next section of the Bible, um, Old Testament, which is basically, well, I, I have to name all of them, but who can think major prophets, minor prophets, and quite a few of the books of history, including first and second Samuel. Uh, first Samuel, where we read the other story with King Saul. So basically, Abraham is pointing to the Old Testament with the Easter. But I also want to highlight someone who was raised from the dead. If they don't believe the Old Testament, they won't believe somebody who was raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. Mainly pointing forward to Jesus, who is the subject of the entire New Testament. Mm -hmm. So Abraham is saying, well, if they don't believe the Old Testament, neither will they believe the New Testament, and they have these to consult. Mm -hmm. So rather than let, look to those who have already died, whether they're in the faith or outside of faith, whatever they happen to be, mm -hmm. look to where God speaks to you, mainly through the Old Testament prophets, like the Old Testament as a whole, or through Christ and the witnessing of Christ. So if you have these, you wouldn't need this. And again, these are the only two instances in scripture I know of, I can find, and I've tried to look for more. But there's only two instances I can see where you have somebody trying to come. Even hypothetically, because the rich man in hell, he's, he's trying to advocate for his family so well. So somebody who's alive with looking to somebody who might have been dead. Always pointing to God's word, God's prior commands. Can I ask a, a, a question? No, this has been bothering me. Why did the Catholic Church go back to, okay, uh, all these steps? Uh, Jesus won't hear your prayer unless you pray to a saint who is going to talk to Jesus, who's going to talk to mm -hmm. God. Why do they pray to Mary if he, is that her son too busy to listen to prayer and then we have to come to mummy and mummy has to go and talk to son and <laughs> get yes. her dad back. Uh, I mean this is this yeah. is very convoluted. Why are you why is one church having to go through so yeah. many steps when it's just it's all in the scripture? Just pray to Jesus, he'll listen to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did they make it so convoluted and so <sighs> Yeah, so, so that's a great question, and that's kind of where I wanted to go next. So we, we see through these instances, well, you really shouldn't do it, because we, we have two examples in Scripture, it doesn't really work. No. So where might you try to find this in Scripture? And I won't go through all of why the Roman Catholic Church believes Mary to be in the position she is, because that I will take way too long. Okay. Because I'd have to I'd have to basically show you the dozens and dozens of scriptures they use and how they don't actually say the things that the Roman Catholic say they would say. But <clears throat> uh, in James chapter five, this is one of the classic ones they use. Uh, James chapter five. Uh, verse 16. Uh, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And then, if, but then James immediately goes into the example of Elijah. So Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Uh, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So you can see that there is power in prayer. And we wouldn't deny that. No, there's good power in prayer. Now, 
what the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox, what they do is they take this a step further. They say, well, if Elijah's prayers were effective when he was alive here on earth, then they must still be really effective up in heaven. So his prayers must still be really good, must still be very saintly, and uh, we would want him to, to pray on our behalf in heaven. So they're saying, yes, there's power in prayer, but then they take it a step further and go, well, you have to contact all those who are really strong in the faith, who are already really righteous, and who's more righteous than the people in heaven. But you also have to look what, at what James doesn't say. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. <laughs> so James doesn't say, pray to the people in heaven. What he's actually saying is, uh, um, confess your sins to each other. That is, the people who are here in this world who are still suffering from sin, pray for each other. So not praying to somebody up in heaven. You also don't have to confess your sins to the people up in heaven, but, but confess your sins to each other so that you may be healed. Why would, why would somebody in heaven need to be healed? So if James is identifying this as between human beings in the church that who are sinful, you need to be healed, that doesn't apply to the people in heaven. He's also not saying direct your prayers to heaven, nor is he with the example of Elijah saying that Elijah's prayers are still effective. Elijah is just the example here, and Elijah was praying when he was here on earth. So James is saying there's power in prayer, but he does not mention anything related to praying to somebody in heaven at all. Well, why would you? I mean, if you pray to heaven, you might as well pray to God. Yeah. yeah. There's a, he's got a direct line. You don't have to go through every single emissary just to get a message to him. I know. Yeah, it's, it's one of those weird things. Uh, the next passage I'll go to. Ooh, see if I can find the exact verse. But th this will be in Revelation. Ah, oh, she's where, where is the verse again? Ah, here we go. Um, Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 8. So this is when St. John, who's having the vision, the revelation, where he's in the vision in heaven, he's witnessing things in heaven. And there's a lot of uh, symbolism in the book of Revelation, as, as you might well know. So also take the take the image with as much qualifications as would be necessary for, for symbols. So uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken it, that is the Lamb, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Aww. And this is one of the main verses, main go-to passages that they would use because you have a whole bunch of prayers in heaven. Mm -hmm. But again, you have to see what's actually being said, what's not being said. So in heaven, you have people having incense. Incense is supposed to be figured for prayer. You also have this in prayers, so, uh, in the Psalms. I mean. So let my prayers rise up before you as incense. The raising of my hands is the evening sacrifice. That's in the Psalms. So we already know that this imagery is there. And John is just drawing on that imagery of prayers being like incense. So if somebody's holding a golden bowl full of incense, that means they are communicating the prayers to God. Do you know what the literal meaning of angel is? The literal meaning of the word angel. No. But we will learn that. <laughs> messenger. Messenger, yes. There you go. So if an angel is a messenger and they can give messages down to us here on earth from God, it would also make sense if they're bearing messages up to God for us 
So in heaven, it actually seems that they're doing this, mm -hmm. that my prayer is rising up to God and that angels would be communicating this message that is being put up in heaven. But, uh, and that's kind of why the big uh, Roman Catholics, even or not, why they find this passage very compelling is that when, when, messen when messengers be messaging the other way. But as you'll, you'll notice, it's only this one verse uh, that's really talking about this in this passage. There's another verse later on that's also saying almost the same thing. What you'll, also, you'll see is the, the prayer isn't actually me. What's in the prayer? Who is the prayer directed to? Nothing is said about that. Uh, we just know that the angels in heaven are communicating these things to God. We, all, we also could see Revelation chapter 7 when you have a whole bunch of people around the throne of God magnifying him, praising him, giving him law and other stuff. Well, even in this chapter where people are saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open up its seals. This is basically a prayer to the Lamb. So people are praying in heaven, yes. They can even be praying for people on earth, but there's no passage whatsoever that could support us praying to a saint so that they can convey this message. So scripture doesn't really give you much support for this, which is why. <laughs> well, yeah, that's not why you shouldn't do it. But also why Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox, what they do to try and substantiate this theory is look to the church fathers. Because when I was reading this thing from the Council of Trent before, the main argument they have is not from scripture. The main argument they have is that this is in accordance with the usage of the Catholic Apostolic Church, we see from the primitive times from the Christian religion and with the unanimous teaching of the Holy Fathers. So they're not citing scripture for this. They're citing tradition. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they say they're holding a golden bowl full of uh, of uh, incense and the prayers of the saints. Are they talking about dead saints or lost saints? Uh, we can't say either way. It could be both. Actually, the next verse that's uh, talking about this in Revelation, but not not the next one in the chapter, but the um, oh. I think it's chapter eight, the kind of transport of Paul. Next chapter, it says all the saints. Okay. Which would, okay. so you would assume that it would be living and dead, those who are in heaven and those who are already on earth. Yeah. So you could also theoretically say that those in heaven are making prayers and angels are bringing those prayers already in heaven to God's throne, up to God's throne. Yeah. So, anyway. I was looking through <laughs> through this. This is the examination of the Council of Trent uh, by Martin Kemmons. He's known as the second Martin. So the first Martin was Martin Luther, the second Martin was Martin Kemmons. So he was the one who made a four volume response to the Council of Trent, uh, basically looking over everything that they were saying and going, is this right, is this wrong? And one of the things that he does very, very well is go through the historical church, the actual traditions. Um, and takes a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you have to be scary smart to actually remember. Because he was doing this back before computers and you could have instant searches and cross references. <laughs> I'm very impressed by, by people who could do that. And, and this, I would actually be Martin Luther, uh, Philip Melanchthon, and somebody like Kevin. Mm -hmm. I keep saying, you know, when Martin Luther translated the Bible, he was standing all day <laughs> and he was writing by hand with a quill. <laughs> <laughs> that alone is, is amazing. Never yeah. mind the act of yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but Kenneth was, was going through, he was going through all the early church fathers and he was trying to find evidence of prayers to the saints, among many other things. He was looking through a whole bunch of different doctrines, but the prayers to the saints. He found absolutely no evidence of this in the first 200 years. None. And you could say, well, that might be sparse. Like the, they're, they're, the, the church fathers in the first two centuries, maybe they just didn't have enough writings, maybe this just didn't come up. But uh, 
a fellow that I regularly listen to. He's a Lutheran pastor with podcast, podcast Justin Sinner. Um, he also looked into this himself because he's actually well adept. He studied the, the early church fathers. And he was saying that the early church fathers, who, like in the first 200 years, who don't mention this, there are a couple who are actively saying, don't do any prayers or any veneration other than God, which is the opposite of what, what's said here in, in the Council of Trent. Um, when Kamenetz was looking over this, the first person that he found to do it was this church father called Origen. Origen, middle of the third century AD. Uh, no, sorry, the beginning of the third century. And the problem with Origen is that he takes quite, quite uh, liberal views in certain respects. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I told you there was a church father who thought we had spiritual bodies in heaven because that's the perfect shape. That's Origen. Um, and there have been church councils which have condemned his works. So um, when Kenneth was actually going through the church father Origen, uh, Origen said, maybe the saints pray, maybe you can pray to the saints. And he says, maybe. And he also qualifies that as, I don't know for sure, therefore this should not be made public knowledge. So so he's saying, like, don't publicize this. I don't know if it's true, is the bottom line. Um, and the first instances of somebody actually advocating for prayers to the saints are people who are writing under origin's names, origin's name, but they're not origin. So so they so they have texts from the time which have somebody write, write in origin's name because they because they want the fame the, and, and the notoriety, but they're not origin, and these documents have been proven to be false. But there these those are the guys who are writing on this. And then once you get to the uh, 4th century AD, where you have some of the really great church figures, uh, some of these church figures are now advocating for prayers to the saints. And they're saying, based on this work of origin, which we now know to be false, or based on this other work by this other great church father that we also now know to be false, let's pray to the saints. And then contemporary with those guys in the fourth century who are now saying, let's pray to the saints, you have other guys who are saying, don't pray to the saints and say, don't do this. So even though the Council of Trent is saying that this is unanimous in the early church, it was by no means unanimous. It took centuries to, to take into a, to come into effect, and people were very resistant to it. Well, why would somebody advocate? Playing to the saints, if you can go to the top. And, and oh, we don't have too much time, but I'll try and cover uh, one or one to the arguments rather quickly. So, um, one of the arguments is well, the saints in heaven are holier than us. So they've been stripped of their sinful flesh, therefore, they can pray better than we can. So, basically, going off of what's, what's said in John, sorry, James chapter 5. Uh, another argument has been, well, the saints in heaven, well, they have a better understanding of what's going on in our lives, so they, they've gone through all of this. Therefore, they, they can understand our situation better. But if you're going to say that, you're now saying that God who came in the flesh, who suffered and died and experienced all the sorrows that we have experienced in this world, doesn't understand us. And, you're also, and he's and, and also kind of saying that he's God in the flesh puts a little bit more emphasis on it because he's omniscient. Not only does he know uh, uh, that we're going through these things, but he also has intimate knowledge of all our thoughts and feelings and experiences. So he knows exactly what we're going through, even better than the saints could possibly understand. So yeah, that's not, that's not a good argument. Um, oh shoot, what's the last one? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, that because Jesus Christ will be the judge on Judgment Day, he himself says this, um, that he is all too ready to judge and he will condemn us for our sins. Therefore, we should be praying to the people who, who would be more sympathetic to our cause, meaning the saints. That's the main hope. <laughs> but 
If you're also following that through to its logical conclusion, well, who's the one who loved the world so much that the sun came into it? God loves us so much that he gave us the sun so that while we were still sinners, while we were still in the depths of our, our, our evil, Christ died for us. So if Christ died for us while we were sinners, if we're being cleansed as saints in this life, why wouldn't he continue to show this love for us? So those philosophical arguments that are being brought forward, and I, I just kind of skimmed over very briefly, uh, gone through them. Uh, the philosophical arguments don't hold up. I, I, I can't think of a way for them to hold up. So by scripture, you can't find uh, support for this. And can it also um, reference somebody who, um, Johann Eck, the guy who, who was fighting against Luther in the Reformation, one of, one of the guys. He actually wrote a handbook of the Catholic faith. And even there, he says, you can't find evidence for prayers of the saints in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, no. So even the Catholic, people in the Catholic church are saying, no, you can't find this in the Bible per se. And when we look into some of the verses we can also, that they used to support this, they don't really support it. <laughs> so you have to look to tradition. Does tradition unanimously, unanimously agree with this? No, it does not. No. So then you go to the philosophical arguments. And yeah, those don't hold up either. So because of all these reasons, the Lutheran church among uh, the Protestant churches in general, the Reformed churches in general, we do not pray to the saints. Hmm. Not even with intent. No. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you could really get into the subject far more than I've done this morning, but um, yeah, that, that's a long tour. In other words, they're holding on a tradition that does not have any leg to stand on because you. I wouldn't say that. Okay. I wouldn't say that just because you do have guys like the fourth century and onwards who are saying, let's pray to the saints. Exactly. I would, but what they're not doing is they're not examining these guys first century on who are telling you pray to the saints. You're not examining them uh, according to scripture. You're not examining them according to the other church fathers or, or any, any um, hardcore analysis. So it's not that they don't have any way to stand on because this had to have come into the church at some point in time in order for it to be here today. But they're choosing a side and they're quite honestly choosing a side. Basically, um, I, I would, and this is my speculation, I would assume that what they're doing is saying, since this has been such a long-standing tradition, it must automatically be true because you, if you say that your tradition is an error, then you're now have to call into question all the other traditions that you have. And that would mean basically uh, a lot of the stuff that the Roman Catholics were in conflict with with the reformers because they didn't have scriptural support for a lot of these things. Then they would have to say that the, all these things are possibly wrong, including things like indulgences or penance or what have you. So it's a um, so it would be a very slippery slope to try and say anything that you've taught for hundreds of years and said it's the absolute truth is now an error. So I, I don't, that's, that's my speculation. That's my cynical speculation. Um, you, you wouldn't really find um, uh, Roman Catholics or even Orthodox say, well, that's why we kept it so that we don't, don't compromise tradition. You wouldn't find them saying anything like that. So that's where the problem is. You have so many churches now, each one saying we have the tools, yes, which means exactly. you don't. Well, you can't go on like that. No. <laughs> But um, I think uh, we should wrap up here. Unfortunately, I know there, there could be a lot more questions and other things, but fortunately, uh, or actually, no, but fortunately, we're going upstairs to worship. <laughs> so, uh, let us close in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being a mediator for us, for coming into this world so that we might have someone who truly understands who we are, what we need, and to advocate for, on our behalf before God the Father. We ask you, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, to forgive our sins and bless us with everlasting life.
In your name, O Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.